彼女は君たちに譲るだから許してくださいA short while into the bus ride, the titular disaster begins. A 
massive earthquake throws the bus asunder, toppling buildings and signs and tearing the road into pieces all around. Our main character is knocked unconscious, but comes to shortly after to see the chaos already underway. From here on out, your decisions become key and the overarching plot more or less comes to an end. You decide if your goal is to escape the city or to stay and help as many people as you can. Regardless of what you select, you'll still be following the same story beats, but your personal motivations will be different. I discovered the hard way, unfortunately, that a lot of dialogue choices don't exactly matter beyond how many moral and immoral points you score. These points, however, don't really play into much of anything important. Right off the bat, in the midst of all this chaos, we meet a teacher new to her job. Her three students had gone missing in the earthquake. In my first playthrough, I was ready to give her my undivided attention and return all of her students to her without a hair on their head out of place. On my second playthrough, I essentially told her not to be so selfish, that we're in the middle of a disaster and she should go shove it. She had one line of dialogue where she acted sorry for bothering me so much and even looked a bit afraid of me, but then she immediately reverted to her other dialogue tree and thanked me for all the help I was gonna give her, even though I had denied giving her help. <laughs> That was kind of lame and disappointing, but I do like that all the player character decisions are voiced and acted, as the asshole's choices were generally quite hilarious to witness. From here, you kind of just venture around the city, meeting new people and navigating through their issues. Progression all around is cumbersome, as you'll be walking around and just walking at everything, hoping it'll trigger the next event. Events are often completely detached from everything else and follow little to no logical progression at all, so it's never exactly obvious how to continue. Over one stretch of the game, I went from trying to save people in a flooded town, to essentially leading a cult, to finding a barber a pair of scissors so he'd feel a will to live again. It's all very strange. Some character stories are told in their entirety in a single stretch of the game, while other characters reappear from time to time and you track how they're coping with the state of the city. This is a great idea and I really liked seeing these people pop up again, and seeing if there's anything I could do personally to redirect their life. One of the most interesting to follow was this guy here, who pops up again and again in different abandoned stores, pretending he works at them and charging citygoers exorbitant prices for basic goods like bottled water. It didn't take long for the game to reveal to me that it's not really about navigating the disaster itself, but more so about navigating the social and economic voids created by such a disaster. In this regard, a lot of the game plays out like reading a bunch of different short stories, and it can be a little bit illuminating. I rather like to this aspect, seeing how the world falls apart in times of crisis and what needs to be done to keep it all together, but these stories are radically different from each other and not exactly handled with tact. In one chapter, you may watch a company's stocks plummet, a restaurant shut down and its workers displaced, and a jewelry store owner getting murdered because a thief finally got their big break. However, tone is something this game cannot get right. But I don't really know if that's exactly a bad thing. I like that there's always the option to make your character react the way you want, but sometimes it's just incredibly misplaced and inappropriate. Disaster Report makes sure you understand how severe and serious some of these situations can be. At one point, the scene plays out with a heavy emphasis on it being the emotional, heartbreaking peak of the story. And when prompted to react to it, one of your choices is to be disappointed that the character won't appear in the sequel. While decisions and reactions like that in times like that are certainly a distraction, I will give it credit that it is at least consistent with the rest of the game. Only in the rest of the game, it fits in much better. Disaster Report 4 unfortunately struggles from wanting to have its cake and eat it too. Now. I may have said that Disaster Report 4 is more about navigating social and economic issues in a kind of point-and-click adventure slash visual novel style fashion, but there is still some environmental stuff going on and environmental challenges. There isn't exactly too much related to this, but let's take a look at the environmental side of the gameplay now. 
There are moments, of course, when running around the city, a building or overpass may collapse. Maybe some fires are raging around or certain prefectures are flooding. But for the most part, there's not much gameplay attached to the natural disasters themselves. Really, you just need to climb what can be climbed and stand out of the way of falling debris. At times, earthquakes might knock you to the ground, which in turn lowers your health. And it can raise your stress. The more stressed out you get, the lower your max HP can be until you rest and de-stress. There's other mechanics that feed into the rate at which you get stressed, such as hunger, thirst, and the need to relieve yourself, but these are super easy to keep in check. Stress nor HP ever really affected my playthrough, and I never died simply by taking too much damage. In fact, I believe the only time I ever died was when a piece of the ground fell out beneath me, which of course resulted in an instant game over. When an earthquake or an aftershock is occurring, you need only make sure you're out of the way of anything falling, and then use square to crouch and brace yourself from falling over and taking damage. Now, there is a shout and scream mechanic. Hi! 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 But I never found a use for it. I actually went out of my way trying to get something out of this, but beyond a laugh or two at how ridiculous it sounds, I got nothing. Even here, I was certain that shouting at these people who are standing beneath this ready to fall overpass would alert them and save their lives, but nah, they just stood there and died. Maybe I just wasn't close enough? I don't know, but I could not find any way to use this. On that note, there's a lot here that feels unfinished and like they just left the code in anyway. Multiple times while running around, I found random things that acted as interact points for seemingly no reason. You can't do anything with them and there's no real information attached to inspecting them. The fact that this is a headlight isn't something I need a text box to tell me. It seemed like maybe they planned something for this, but that maybe it just never got finished. Or or perhaps I just didn't follow the right route for them to be useful. In which case, I shouldn't have been able to inspect it to begin with, but either way, it was just very confusing. There's not much gameplay here in Disaster Report 4. There's just light navigation elements and decision making. Every now and then they might mix things up a bit, but it's not for long and it doesn't really affect very much. It's mostly all dialogue and inventory driven. That said, there is most assuredly multiple routes in play and multiple playthroughs seem encouraged. True, not all dialogue choices affect conversation organically or believably, but there is a lot of variety in what can happen. Just for example, there was a point where an NPC I had a lot of previous interaction with got severely hurt and needed a doctor, but I couldn't find a doctor to help him, and I feel as though I made a bad decision in the chapter before that led the doctor to being where I didn't need him to be. After looking around a bit and not being able to find a doctor, I had no choice but to leave my friend behind, and I'm pretty sure that he died shortly after. But those were my decisions that led to his death. That's the fallout of my actions and something that could legitimately occur in a situation such as this. So. I'm cool with my failure there. I earned it. Yeah, this game probably isn't looking too hot to too many of you yet, and it's about to look a whole lot worse. So let's look at the technical aspects. First of all, since it's probably already super obvious, the frame rate is horrid at times. Incredibly inconsistent is the name of the game here. Sometimes it runs so smooth it feels weird, other times we're averaging 15 to 20 FPS. In fact, I would say most of the time that's the average. At this point, however, this is par for the course for the series. If it ran well, I'd question if it was even a disaster report game. Sadly, the devs just don't really know how to optimize stuff like this. While it's manageable as the games never require quick acting, it kind of gives up the ghost a bit, so to speak. If things are running really badly, you know a large building or something in the surrounding area is movable and will therefore likely collapse at any moment. Visually, the game is hit or miss. Most of it looks like a dated PS3 game with dated and budget textures, but some of the textures are way better than they need to be as well. The lighting effects are probably better than necessary and the use of seemingly legitimate reflections on objects is a nice touch, but both things I personally would have axed or scaled back to improve the performance. Sound effects, again, they're budget and so too is the music. Though the music is used incredibly sparingly and despite it being rather budget sounding, it does kind of fit the tone of the game. The, uh, the rather inconsistent tone. Voiceovers are Japanese only and not exactly bad, but they don't always fit the body language too well. <laughs> Mina,
And speaking of body language, even though the game lets you select male or female avatars, there is only one library of animations, which can lead to some questionable scenes. As a nice little detail too, there is unique animations contextual to the weather that I just wasn't expecting. In terms of its translation and localization, it could be better. The translation is plenty understandable, but it does at times feel stilted. Unfortunately though, there is a couple points with flat out errors that are just unfortunate and inexcusable. At this point here, for instance, the same dialogue option is listed twice. I reloaded my file a couple of times just to select them both, and they do not correspond to the same thing. I anticipate this is going to be fixed before or shortly after launch, but it's just something to be aware of. Now that we've talked about all the important stuff, the game probably looks pretty bad. And that's because, ultimately, it is. In almost every way, in almost every box you can check off, it's kind of horrid. From its controls, to its performance, to the logical progression of events. And of course, the absolute insane tone and the terrible writing. From top to bottom, Disaster Report 4 is a bit of a disaster. And I really liked it. I know, I haven't exactly sold this game too well. Disaster Report as a series is a cult franchise, and this game is not going to see the series become anything more than that. Disaster Report is a game that I'd file right alongside games like Deadly Premonition or a Michigan Report from Hell. I would probably take those two games over this one, but I'd still take this game regardless. It's a rare breed. Whether legitimately intrigued or so baffled I just had to continue, I found myself incredibly drawn to the game and sucked into its rabbit hole of quirks. At no point did I feel bored or compelled to end my playthrough. I couldn't disagree with how some of it plays out any more than I do, but I kind of love it for that. I did go into this game wanting more focus on the natural disasters themselves, and a little bit of me will always be disappointed that it wasn't about that. I was looking for a quirky game where you just run through burning and falling buildings saving nameless NPCs for 6 hours, but instead, I get a confusingly tone deaf 12 hour game about social and economic strife in disaster zones. There was never any predicting what might come next, and what comes next was always so far beyond what I felt was appropriate or sensible that I couldn't help but stay invested. This probably isn't a good sales pitch and I don't suspect many people will be sold on the game, but I would never try to sell many people on it to begin with. This is not for everybody, hell it's hardly for anybody at all, but it is certainly for me. While this wasn't the blend I thought I was going to get, I still largely got what I was looking for in it, and overall, I can't say I'm disappointed. Disaster Report 4 is one of the most baffling games I think I've ever played, and the things it does poorly, which is almost everything it does at all, end up compounding to be its greatest strengths. If you're somebody who can't enjoy things on an ironic level, you're gonna wanna steer very clear of this one, as this could very well be, to you, one of the worst games you'll ever take a look at. If you do enjoy those weird, quirky, underdeveloped, micro-budget games that are so bad they're good, then maybe consider giving this one a look. It's not the best game of its sort, but there aren't very many games of this sort in general. So me, personally, I'm gonna take what I can get. Personally, I felt like Disaster Report delivered on something that is largely missing in media today, and granted, it's missing because it doesn't appeal to many people, but it does appeal to me. And that's all I'm gonna say on Disaster Report 4, ladies and gentlemen. If you guys enjoyed this video, you know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you can. Links to all of my socials are in the description below, and as always, thanks for watching.